I just want to start with a personal discernment issue in terms of God's dream for us. And I don't wanna make this um, the heart of the discussion, but I just wanna share a discernment experience that ties into what we talked about the last time and something I'm experiencing right now uh, at the university. Uh, what happened was uh, about a week or two ago, uh, the Vatican came out uh, with a statement about uh, blessing gay uh, unions. I don't know if you're all familiar with this. And um, this, of course, especially with students, caused quite a stir. And my office is the, the Office of Mission Integration, Ministry, and Multicultural Affairs. Multicultural Affairs includes everything. Uh, in terms of anything that anyone's not happy about comes into my office. <laughs> so multicultural affairs are racial issues, cultural issues, and also sexual orientation issues. So there's a great deal of pain among students and also some faculty. So they're in my office and, you know, I listened to this for many hours uh, in the past week and a half. And I have to share with you, it was just a painful listening uh, for me, but it was listening, all right? So in, in any kind of discernment and trying to get a sense of where God is, it always begins with a deep listening. And uh, so I did the deep listening, right? And then after the deep listening, I says, well, uh, where is God in this? What's going on here? And in my own prayer, before I brought it to others, I, my sense was that there was something not right about this. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And it was just, you know, it wasn't just like what my feelings were. But I had a sense that the way this thing came out, I had trouble seeing that this was coming from God. I understood that it was coming from a document. But in my gut, I said, there's just something about this that's not right, right? I felt. Now, I could be wrong, right? Uh, very similar, by the way, uh, at one time, the church endorsed slavery. Uh, and there were people who said, well, there's something about this. And it, it took time to get to a point of understanding or challenging what that view was. It's not questioning anybody's sincerity or any of that kind of thing. Okay. So anyway, long story short, uh, I got together with students and I said, listen, uh, I, I realize you're coming from different religious perspectives, whatever, but I like to actually take the scriptures and read to you from the scripture. I read the scripture and I said, we need to spend some time praying, whatever prayer means for you. Then I brought together staff and some faculty and together we talked through this and prayed through it, right? So the outcome was on Monday, uh, Monday, we're going to have a gathering. Uh, it's going to be a private gathering because the gay and lesbian students did not feel safe. Uh, it'll be private um, to really affirm and celebrate who they are. And then there will be a second event in which we'll have a colloquium presentation on the Vatican document. This is not to get into a discussion on this point, but my point to you is it took us a week and a, by the way, the fact that you can do this in a week and a half is kind of extraordinary. Usually you're taking more time, but in this instance, because of the urgency, my concern wasn't that, that we just would not be reacting to things, but responding and trying to say, where is God in this, all right? Without getting into the politics of it all. But I just share that with you as a process of discernment um, that we went through uh, at the university. Okay, so I'm just gonna, and then this will influence the stuff I'm going to share with you um, in this discernment section. I'm gonna take leftover questions uh, from the last time that you might have or comments. So let me begin with Kristen's comment in question. You alluded to the impact of your father, your desire to please him, and the deep emotional response his memory invoked in your dreams and surfaced when you were addressing meeting a fellow, a meeting a fellow priest. In a subsequent homily at mass, you again alluded to your father in a slightly different context. Clearly there's something there. I am just halfway through the Ahed uh, Akhtar's superb homeland uh, elegies. Uh, Adgar writes about the power of capturing and analyzing one's dreams. He claims this is what has made him a successful writer. So 
I just want to briefly talk about dreams. Um, I, I don't think we got into this the last time, but she brings it up. I am big into dreams, uh, not just because I have them. And I'll tell you why. Um, I do believe when you read the scriptures, God very often speaks to people in dreams. Now, why is this so? When I am awake, I am very much in control. My ego is driving the ship, right? When I am asleep, I'm letting go. I'm out of control. And God has half a chance of getting in, all right? When, during the day, I might or might not let him in, all right? But when I'm sleeping, God can jump in whenever God wants to jump in, right? And so uh, the point being that what I do is if I have a dream, I write it down. And I write it down as soon as I wake up. I used to at one time, this gets into another issue, uh, when I would wake up, if, if I had a dream, I programmed myself to wake up and to write it down right then and there. That's, that's another issue because I did a whole thing on dreams in general. But for our purposes here, I would include dreams uh, in your discernment process. And I'm not suggesting that the dream is going to give you a clear direction, but what my experience has been, if you look at your dreams over a period of time, very frequently you'll find that there are themes that emerge. And very often what happens is things that I don't want to deal with or things that are bothering me or things from my past are showing up in my dreams, right? So that's Kristen's question about uh, dreams and the place of dreams in discernment and also in spiritual direction. Father Tony, thank you what you said about dreams that resonates with me because I do believe in them as well, but help me understand how should we think about dreams from a spiritual standpoint? Is there something that would help make that bridge? Do you do particular studies for that? I mean, how, how does one look at dreams from a spirit, through a spiritual lens? Okay, good, Tim, a great question. Um, and you know, this is an example of, there's a lot of writing out there on dreams right now. And uh, some of it really is some of the new agey stuff. Uh, but also, as you know, there are systems of therapy that also bring in dreams, right? So that said, from a, simply from a spiritual perspective, all right? This is, not, this is not analytical, nor is it psychological. It's really spiritual. So uh, in terms of looking at it in that way is when you have a dream, every aspect in the dream is about you. You are showing the film, you're the usher, you're making the popcorn. Uh, every, every character in the dream is you, right? And every character in the dream is telling something about what's going on in you, right? And so journaling is very important because if you're anything like me, uh, you have junior moments. And the junior moments are, you know, after, an hour after I'm awake, I don't remember what I dreamt. I don't even remember what I ate for breakfast, right? So that said, the importance as soon as you get up writing it down, and for myself, I don't spend like hours writing it down. I don't have hours in the morning. It might be a couple of minutes and it might be just a few quick notes. And then just if I keep that in my journal and I, at one point, usually once a month, I look at what's going on and I usually get a picture in terms of the dreams. Uh, I'll give you just a few quick examples. Um, <laughs> I mentioned um, my father dreams the last time. I also have had a series, by the way, this is like psychoanalysis stuff. Uh, I had a series of mother's dreams, right, about my mother. And uh, my mother was a great woman. But these dreams were not happy dreams, all right? By the way, there's an expression, mirror, mirror on the wall. You I am my mother after all. You've heard this. Yeah. So, <laughs> so some of that stuff was popping up. So what this said to me, I had mother issues to deal with, all right? And so I prayed with this, all right, for several weeks. And I'm not saying, Tim, that it's fully resolved, but see, the problem is if I don't deal with this, God is father, God is mother, and how I'm relating to my parents is very much gonna influence how I relate to God. I was, I honestly, Tim, I thought I had dealt with all this stuff, all right? And the fact that I had these dreams, I was very surprised right? 
And I was looking at it simply from a more, uh, let me use this word, negative perspective. But in my prayer, I had to, I had to deal with that and go through my own personal healing, but then also to recognize that beyond this negative, it was mostly good stuff in terms of my mother, a very loving woman. But these dreams were pointing out this other aspect of some stuff that I had not dealt with. Uh, now, by the way, this is something you can deal with on your own. You can deal with it with a spiritual director, a counselor, a therapist, a good friend, or whatever. Um, so there's multiple ways of how you might deal. I, I want to be clear. I would not, I would not uh, talk about the sermon exclusively in terms of dreams. I think that would be a mistake, but I would include it as a component. One of my religious brothers does a lot of dream work for himself. And I would say most of us probably have our cell phones next to the bed. And so if you wanted to do uh, record what your dream was, all you have to do is pick up your phone and you can make a voice recording. That might be quicker than trying to write it down. And the advantage of that too is that later on in the day, you write it down. So you really kind of reviewed it twice. So just a practical idea. Thanks, Tim. Actually, Tim, that's thanks for sharing that. Because sometimes when I write it down early in the morning, I can't read my writing later in the day. So that becomes a problem. So thank you. OK, so in the first slide, it, it says the sermon part two, God's dream for us. What I want to get into here, last time we talked about discernment and where God is calling me. And that's important, all right, because unless I get a sense of discernment on the personal level and start dealing with this stuff, when we start talking about doing discernment as a group, this becomes more challenging and it's going to be difficult to happen if, in fact, uh, we are not used to this whole idea of what discernment is. Now, something that I think is really important uh, and I think about this all of the time. Whenever I need to make a decision, my starting point is always, well, what do I want to do? Right? What do I think needs to happen? Right? Now, not that that's bad. I mean, that's a good thing. But I don't think it's the right question. The right question is, is for people of faith is, well, what, what does God want me to do? Right? And oftentimes, when I ask that question, I don't have an immediate solution, all right? But nevertheless, if we believe that God has a desire for us and that God has a plan for us, that's the ultimate question, all right? So for example, if your question is, you know, should I, um, uh, no. Well, let's take this. Suppose it's the, um, uh, the racial issue or, or the gay issue in terms of what's dividing our culture. Should I get more involved in terms of Black Voices Matter? Should I get more involved with gay and lesbian rights? Now, that's I. The question should be, is God calling me to this in some way? So I mentioned the last time Dan Berrigan, it was very important to him. He took very courageous stances because he prayed it through, talked it through with others. And once he did that and had a sense of, assur a sense of, of assurance, that is what God was calling him to, there was no stopping him, right? So that, that's really uh, an important point. So really, where is God calling me? So, for example, God might call, uh, let's say, Mother Teresa to leave everything and go walk the streets of Calcutta. It's Mother Teresa. Is God calling me to leave everything and to go walk the streets of New York City to be with the homeless? I'm not Mother Teresa. But maybe God is calling me to that. Or the problem is, it could be my ego. And because I want neon lights on me, look at me. 
I'm taking care of the homeless in New York City, you see? So the point being that where is it or how is it that God is calling me, right? And oftentimes, as I say, it takes time to get there. Now, there's three elements that we need to look at. It's values, mission, and vision. And let's talk about each of them. Values. I, uh, we need to spend time individually and collectively to talk about what are the values and how do I prioritize my values, right? So for example, um, depending on whatever the parish community might be, let's say we're out in the Midwest somewhere, not in New York. So a value might be how to, uh, how to reach out to poor farm workers, right? Or my value might be, um, what about the role of women? Or a value might be, um, you know, how do I bring justice to the poor and disenfranchised, whatever. And in, in any group, in any individual, but then in any group, we need to get our arms around what are the values that we all uh, agree on or have consensus on. Now, nobody's going to argue against love. Nobody's going to argue against justice. Nobody's going to argue against like liturgy and stuff like that. But the argument or the discussion would be, how do we prioritize these things? You see, and see that is where you get into a group discussion and a group discernment. What are our values and how do we prioritize them? It's very important to spend time there because that's gonna influence what we call our mission. So once we begin talking about, okay, these are the values, right? So again, we're out in the Midwest and suppose our big issue is taking care of farm workers and crops and blah, blah, blah. Well, our mission then is to be in solidarity with farm workers and help them in this time of drought and also financial uh, difficulties or whatever. That, that jumps to the top of what our mission is because we say that is our core value. Everybody with me on this? All right. Now, the vision part of it is, what are we gonna do about it? See, this is praying with your feet. You've heard this before. You know, it's not enough to say, uh, I send you my support and prayers. People are tired of that. You've heard this, right? So the vision is, if we get to that point, we say, well, what is it that we're going to do, right? Uh, well, we might decide to do nothing. And that might be fine because the Lord might be calling us to wait in silence. Or it might be, well, with the farm workers, we need to go down to the local government and we're gonna have picket signs. Or if it was the Vietnam War with Daniel Berrigan, it led him to burning draft cards and burning records in Groton, Connecticut that put him in jail, right? So that's not to be taken lightly or cavalierly. And not everybody is necessarily called to the same thing. But in this instance, we're also gonna be talking about how are we as a group being called? Is, is there a group call here? And maybe there is and maybe there isn't. But see, that's what takes a lot of time to really be with and to listen carefully. All right. And the way I like to look at it is this. Uh, you look at this values, mission, and vision. Uh, an image that I love is the image of when cathedrals were built in the Middle Ages. By the way, if I had to do it over again, I would be born in the Middle Ages. I love that time period. I like all like the castles and the drama and the costumes and all that stuff. I love the Middle Ages. So in the Middle Ages, with the building of cathedrals, and I don't know if you've been to some of the cathedrals uh, in Europe, uh, really stunning. And these cathedrals would take several lifetimes to build, right? It could take a hundred years. By the way, uh, even in a place like in Newark, Sacred Heart Cathedral, that took 150 years to build because it was money from the immigrants. Anyway, this when Notre Dame Cathedral was being built, St. Bonaventure tells a story. He walked into the into this 
thing that was being built. And he says to one person, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm making mosaics. And what are you doing? I'm making statues. And what are you doing? Uh, I, I am, um, I'm carving pews, right? And you, what are you doing? And the final person says, I am building a cathedral. See, and that's the vision here that it, it, we have little parts that we're gonna be talking about. But in the end, when we speak of a group discernment, we as a community are building a cathedral and representing how different parts are coming together to make this cathedral happen. Okay, can we look to the next slide? So how does God speak to you? Does God speak to you? I hope so, right? The problem is that God is speaking 24 seven, all right, constantly. So, you know, for example, I thought of this the other day is the Feast of the Annunciation. So am I waiting for the angel Gabriel to pop in and, and give me a message kind of thing? When we talk about God speaking, oftentimes that's what we think about. I'm waiting for lights, cameras, action. God's going to jump in and speak to me now. Doesn't work that way. When we talk about God speaking, God speaks to us as we read in the first book of Kings in the tiny whispering sounds. God is communicating constantly. God's trying to tell us something individually and collectively, right? How does that happen? In multiple ways. It happens uh, in my feelings. It happens in my reading. It happens when I walk in nature. It happens when I'm doing nothing. It happens when I'm watching television. Blah, 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 blah. All the events of every day, God's trying to say something. And if you're anything like me, you can be very thick. It takes time for the message to get through. Sometimes it takes years in terms of what God's been trying to say. But trust me, God is trying to say something. Here's the bottom line. Does God have a plan for you or doesn't he? Does God have a plan for St. Francis de Sales or doesn't he? This is God's parish, not yours, not mine. This is very, very important. It's God's kingdom, not my kingdom. So how are we serving God's kingdom so it doesn't become my kingdom? And at the end of the day, we all want it. We all have our own, I don't know, way of saying, well, I want to make it my way. It's like the fellow, what's his name? Uh, from Hoboken, Sinatra. You know, I want to do it my way. So what is it God's way? So God is speaking to us. So a couple of important points. And I'll talk about this in another minute. The Second Vatican Council opened up the floodgates in terms of how God speaks. It used to be, you want to know how God speaks? Listen to the bishop. Listen to the pastor. The old story of Archbishop Walsh, when he was the Archbishop of Newark before my time, he was a bit of a character. And on ordination day, he'd be banging the crozier they sent on the ground and all the priests are kneeling, they were just ordained. This is on this very happy day. And do you know what he would say? Do you wanna to get to heaven? This is on ordination day. And they're all kneeling down. One day, your casket is going to be laying, in, your body's going to be laying in a casket in some parish in this archdiocese. You want to get to heaven, fathers? Oh, yes, 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 Archbishop. Only one way. Do what the pastor tells you. <laughs> that, that was his message. Then, of course, now we have all these fancy cardinal appeals and all that. His message, because this, this was a different time. He'd get up and he'd say, your best prayer is a dollar. That's what he would say. Your best, that, that's how he would do the Archbishop's appeal, appeal. But the bottom line was, God speaks through the authority. Now, it doesn't say that God doesn't speak to you. God does. But now, because of the council, we realize it's not the only way that God speaks. You see? See, and this is very, very key. Now, also... God's revelation is ongoing. See, the problem is people say, okay, you close the Bible, last book of the Bible, revelation is finished. No, 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 no. Keep in mind, the Bible was written by imperfect people. The Bible is a bumpy book, bumpy. So for example, 
you look at the images of God in the Bible, it's up and down and all over the place. Why? Because God revealed to individual persons in different times. When we talked of the Bible as a whole, you begin to see a picture, you see? But it's very dangerous if you take just one section of the Bible, and it's very dangerous if you think God's revelation stops uh, at the book of Revelation. It doesn't stop. God continues to reveal. So let me put it this way. The same spirit who inspired the writers of scripture is inspiring you as the reader of scripture. Very, very important. Now, this is problematic, very problematic. So for example, uh, and I, I, by the way, just so you know, I respect the sincerity of these people. These people on January 6th, the insurrectionists, or the, or the, uh, or, or, or the, our own national terrorists, however you want to call them, right? A lot of these people were Christian. You know this, right? A lot of them prayed. They prayed in the Capitol before they did these acts of destruction. Now, honestly, I don't for one minute question their sincerity. I really don't. And probably some of them are better people than I am. They believe what they were doing. Now, my view is they were misguided. And this is the problem. You need to be very careful of anyone who speaks for God rather than to God. So these very sincere people, my opinion, were very misguided and had a very warped notion of how God speaks. Why is this important? There's a lot of people in the country and in the church are of this ilk. Now I'll give you another example of Pope Francis. Is he the Pope or isn't he? Does anybody know? Is he the Pope or isn't he? Bottom line, the nuncio, Christophe Pierre, said to me, because uh, he comes to our place periodically, says to me, Tony, who is the Pope? Who is the Pope, he says to me. Because you have people like Cardinal Burke and others whose names I will not mention, who speak a voice very different than the Pope. And in our own archdiocese, there are those who openly speak against the Pope. You understand the problem here. They, they've actually moved outside of Catholicism when they start doing stuff like this. So you have say, uh, Pope Francis is saying one thing, Cardinal Burke has set up his own magisterium. This he can't be. What you have is a schism in the church. Now it's not a formal schism, but it is a psychological and a spiritual schism that's going on. Who is the Pope? And so therefore, in terms of discernment and how God speaks, within the Catholic tradition, we do believe that God speaks through the Holy Father. Now, it doesn't mean that everything the Holy Father says is authoritative. So if he says, you know, I drink uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts coffee and Dunkin' Donuts is better than Starbucks, well, good for you. Right, so you need to also not be, uh, you, you need to be careful of a Catholic fundamentalism here, right? So if you take uh, the document on revelation of the Second Vatican Council, very, very important. So when you look at this document of the council, right? And by the way, there were about 2,400 bishops who were at the council. And on all of the documents, the vote in favor was 99% of the bishops there. So this document, it was something like 2,973 2, bishops voted for this. Five bishops did not. This is a roadmap in terms of how we understand revelation. And I'm gonna briefly speak of this, but this is something that's worthy of a lot more attention I'm just gonna, I'm just going for the broad strokes here. All right. So revelation as doctrine. There's certain things that we know where God speaks to us, all right, in terms of the church over centuries. So an example of revelation as doctrine, we believe that there are three persons in one God. We're talking about Trinity. Do we understand what that means? No, but it's God's revelation to us, right? So that's an example of revelation as doctrine. 
revelationist history is simply God is revealing God's self in the context of everyday life. That's history. So we're, we're talking about real people. We're not talking about plastic statues. So God reveals to real people historically over a long period of time. God reveals through my experience. So when I walk outside and I look at the flowers, the trees, the birds, and whatever else I'm looking at, God is saying something to me through my experience, right? God is revealing me, is revealing God's self to me through a dial, dialectical presence. What do I mean by that? As I interact with other people. And as I interact with other people, it's either calling me to new ways, or even if there's disagreement, there is something about the interaction where God is speaking, right? When you look at the scriptures, that's always the case. God has people interacting with each other, right? God does not deal with us outside of our relationship with each other. And then finally, revelation brings us to a new, new awareness. It doesn't mean that we have new revelation, but we have a new awareness. So for example, on the role of women, at one time, women don't vote, uh, women just make the coffee, uh, women don't show up on the altar and blah, 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 blah. And that's how we saw it, right? Uh, and for us as lay people, we pray, pay and obey. That's what lay people do, right? That's how we saw it. But as time has gone on, we've come to a different under or deeper understanding. It doesn't mean that in fact, we have a new revelation, but it has been evolving to this point before which we were not able to grasp this, but now we do, but it's a gradual process. Now, why is this important? Right now, as we'll see in a few minutes, we are in the midst of this very gradual process. And what do I mean by this? Something new is emerging, something new, and we need to pay attention. Okay, if we can move to the next. Okay, I'm going to speak briefly of this because this is another thing that can go on forever. Models of the church. All right, now there are um, uh, six, by the way, this is from Avery Dulles. And this is when he talks about models of the church, he is taking images that came out of the Second Vatican Council. Now, what I ask you to note, and the first time, the first uh, book that he wrote on models of revelation, right? He wrote five models. He thought about it for a couple of years and wrote a second edition and added a six model. So the point I want to make is that it, he evolved in his thinking. Each of these models have pluses and minuses. Why is it important for us to grasp this? Well, because as a parish community, how do we see ourselves as church? Now, we are the one Catholic church, but I want to suggest to you that the Church of St. Francis de Sales might have a very nuanced ecclesiology that's very different from what's the neighboring church down the street there. Right? So, so a good council might have a particular ecclesial slant. We have a different slant. We're both Catholic. But I want to say Catholic with a different nuance. Did you follow this? We're still under the same tent. But what we need to figure out is how are we as church and the community that's gathered here? Because when the scripture is proclaimed, it is proclaimed to a particular community, right? So when it's proclaimed at St. Francis the Sales, it's proclaimed to you how God wants to speak to this community at the other uh, place. They might hear it in another way. So it isn't that God is giving, you know, different revelations, but there might be different twists for different communities, depending on what the needs are, you see. Anyway, long story short, I'm going to briefly talk about these models. The church as an institution, all right, this goes back to the 16th century. The church is a perfect society. This is the Roman church. And it is a church that is very clerical. It teaches, it sanctifies, etc. And it is a triumphalistic model. That said, 
we are an institution, whether you like it or not. So it is a good thing because an institution holds us together, you see? The downside of that model is there's very little of any basis in scripture for it. That's the downside, but there's a plus side. Okay, and again, I'm giving you a quick overview. If you read the book, it goes to this whole thing. The second is the church as community. And that notion of church is that we are an interpersonal fellowship, right? That we are a community, we are the people of God. There is a scriptural precedent for this model that speaks of the church as the body of Christ and as the people of God, right? Now, and that's a good thing. The danger of that model is that we can divinize the community and seeing it as an entity unto itself, right? The next is the church as sacrament. And so the whole notion of sacrament is that we are, we become a community who model Christ, Christ's presence in the world, right? And so with this particular model, the advantage is it gives us a job description that we're supposed to become like Christ, a sacrament, right? But basically the problem with it is that the, this model can be very inward looking. All right, the church also has a mission that moves outside. The next is the church as herald. The church is a community that proclaims the word of God and it is based in the word of God, right? Very important. The problem with it is there's also a tradition, a 2000 year tradition. In Protestant communities, they will look only at the word. We look at the word, but also the tradition. The next is the church as a servant. And that simply means that we are called to serve others and to care for others, right? That basically, the, and the danger of that model, we could see the church as being subordinate or being obedient to the needs of the world, right? So there's pluses and minuses to all, right? Finally, Dulles in his later years he came up with this. I happen to like this myself. The church is a community of disciples. And in that model, everybody has a place around the table, right? And in that model, and by the way, this business of cleric and lay, that's a Catholic thing. You realize that. In other traditions, they don't talk of what, what's a lay person? Tell me, All right? So we get hung up on this, who's cleric, who's lay, and all this kind of thing, right? Uh, in other traditions, it, 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 it makes no sense, right? Why? And by the way, there was a thing a, a bunch of years ago called lay ecclesial ministers, right? And not to get off on this, but people who were more involved in the church, uh, and this whole thing fell apart after a period of time, needed a title, all right? And so we had to give a title, you're a lay ecclesial minister. Well, you're not, you just come to church twice a week, so you're not a lay ecclesial minister. So we get into this kind of thing, right? So therefore, a community of disciples is not saying that we don't have a hierarchy, we do. But we're all in this together. The bottom line is this, no one model is sufficient unto itself. What it is, is really a combination of all of them. So when we talk about church, it's embracing all of these models. And if we think deeply, we take all of these models and we understand who we are as a church, incorporating each and every one of those aspects in one way or another. This is St. Francis de Sales. And by the way, let's see if I have this book here. Uh, where did I put it? So here it is. Okay. Can everybody see this? Okay, this is not an easy book to read, St. Francis de Sales, Introduction to Devout Life. To tell you how long I've had this book, can everybody see the price? 95 cents. All right. You can even get a cup of coffee for 95 cents, all right? It's a classic, all right? And again, the language is not our language. But what I wanna tell you is this, is that St. Francis de Sales, uh, is a great model for us as a parish community. Uh, 
from this perspective. He's someone who lived, uh, he's someone who lived in the 16th and 17th century. He lived in a time where the church was fighting the Reformation. He lived in a time where spirituality was very rigid, right? And he had the ability to move beyond this. So he's a real model of someone who thought outside the box and stayed within the church. So for example, in, addition, in his introduction to the devout life, do you know what he talks about? The universal call to holiness. Now you might yawn when I say this. Well, in the 16th century, only priests and nuns were holy. Right, not schleppy lay people, right? only priests and nuns. That's who was holy. He talked about the universal call to holiness. Where did you hear this? The Second Vatican Council. This guy was 400 years ahead of his time and paid the price for it. And it was also the time of the Inquisition. And he was questioned on this. How can you say that schleppy lay, that he is word schleppy, that's my word, are called to holiness? He had to explain himself, right? Got in trouble for it. But again, this was his own discernment that was going on. He also wrote a work, a work, Treatise on the Love of God. So his spirituality in a time that was anything but loving, because the whole concern was to rally around the flagpole, because Protestants were attacking us, right? And was to attack back, right? And in this culture of attack, he wrote about the love of God. And he's saying, don't lose your focus. It's about the love of God. So he becomes, I won't go on and on on this point. He becomes a model for us in terms of thinking outside the box. And that's how St. Francis de Sales thought, outside the box in terms of a spirituality. I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. Uh, so I would be interested in hearing uh, your reactions, your questions, and you may not even agree with this stuff, and that's fine too, but I think it's important now to hear from you uh, in terms of your questions and or reactions. At the beginning when you said, um, you know, and something that you were doing seemed like therapy, uh, some, some part of your process particularly in the, uh, seemed like therapy. And I've just been having that conversation uh, with my brother this morning because he was talking about the, the sacrament of reconciliation. And he said, sometimes it feels like therapy. And, um, and I, I was struck by the idea that both, you know, both he and I, we have this idea that when you're talking church or you're talking religion, you know, it has to have a purity that, it, that uh, if it's too good for you, it can't be right. Um, when, you, when I think about Lent and I think, oh, I'll give up dessert. And I think, oh, you know, you're only doing that because you'll lose a few pounds, you know, and we don't really think in terms that you can have both, that, that you, I, I don't mean that confession is therapy, but there, there is something there that is akin and, we think that therefore we must be doing it wrong or we shouldn't do stuff we you know we shouldn't give up stuff for lent only you know because it's good for us we should think of something else and it, there's like a trust level that my my brother and i don't have in terms of the church it it seems that it's it's a separate entity you know that that it, it you can't follow it in a way that also seems to feel good too too, or seems to um, mirror the, the way you live, you know, that, that idea that it's too, you know, that, that it's supposed to be something different. It's supposed to be something harder. It's supposed to be something whatever. And the fact that you also feel good at the same time is somehow a, a, a problem in, 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 in the way you are practicing your religion. Thank you, Alice. It's a great point. Uh, I'll give a thought or two, but others might want to respond as well, right? Uh, Alice, the first is this, even though I preach against this, uh, I did give up cookies uh, because I got 
COVID-15. And uh, that's when you gain weight. So mm -hmm. this is very, very bad theology and blah, 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 blah. But listen, if I lose some weight, I think uh, that's a good thing. So is that a, a high motive? Not really. Does it really matter? I don't think so. So whatever you do is fine. Um, and the other issue is this, <clears throat> the more we can see things in an integrated way, the better. Uh, reconciliation is not therapy, but reconciliation is a good thing. It's something about the human spirit, right? So when I go to reconciliation, I am reconciling my spirit with the spirit of God and the spirit of the church and those around me. That said, uh, therapy uh, is also a, a way in which God speaks to us, right? So therapy, and I've been in therapy myself a couple of times, uh, therapy is about the human spirit. So sometimes we might be at points in life where we need to go deeper. The sacrament is not therapy. That's not the purpose of the sacrament. Uh, it's really about that spiritual healing. But that said, therapeutic things might happen. But that said, the notion of therapy, right, and, and, and going through a period of therapy, God can also be working in that way, depending on what's going on in your life. Alice, I'm not sure if I'm answering what you were looking for. Well, I, I was, I, you were. I, it's that I think integration is um, the, the key to what I'm talking about, that we were both finding that we were not integrating our spiritual life with our you know real life and when we did we thought there was something wrong with that you know and so we're we're moving along here but it, it is that integration that i was talking about yeah let me say one other thing and then see what others want you all know i'm italian and on good friday it's an italian thing they make this thing called pizza game i don't know if you've heard of it but it is uh, this very delicious dough thing with sausage and pepperoni and whatever. <clears throat> now on Good Friday, especially in the old days, uh, you cannot eat meat. So they would make this on Good Friday to torture you. So you would smell like the meat, you would smell the pepperoni, and it was like torture, right? And that was the whole idea, torture you. I mean, I'm overstating this a bit. But that's what it was, torture you. I can't eat these things, right? Oh, that's a holy thing because now I'm being tortured, right? You understand how, and again, this is not questioning anybody's motives. You realize how warped that is. Does, does God want to torture me? No, but see, it's an image of God that we carry around with us that says harder is better, right? And so if it's not hard, well, I guess it can't be good because God doesn't want you to have fun, you see? Uh, and so therefore there's a whole, there's a whole other um, theology and a Jansenism under that that's very unhealthy. And we still suffer from that in many respects. And, and now it's what it is, harder is better, All right? So I gotta, gotta smell that sausage, but I can't eat it. Oh, that's a good thing now. Is it really a good thing? What kind of God would do something like that? Think about this. I don't eat hot dogs. I don't like hot dogs. I don't, I, I, I don't, I get sick looking at hot dogs. So I'm not telling you to eat hot dogs. But what kind of God would send you to hell for all eternity for eating a hot dog? Do you think God cares you eat a hot dog on Friday? But this is the idea. Eat the hot dog, you go to hell. Imagine that for eating a hot dog. But people thought this kind of thing. So there's an image there in grain. I'd like to pick up on the earlier point that you started this session with, Father Tony, a very real issue on your campus. And I'm so respectful of you ha having to deal with it in that way. But and, and it comes to the point of what you're saying earlier as well about how does God speak to us? Um, when we hear a few words from the Pope himself a few years ago on a plane, who am I to judge? And, and, and that was his stance at the time on people with various sexual persuasions and so forth. And it seemed so refreshing and it seemed like it came directly to me at least from God. And yet this past few days, we have this institution, the church 
issuing a formal paper, which seems like it has been redacted and prepared and signed by the same Holy Father. And that's the institution. But how, how are we to know which God is speaking, who God is, where is God speaking to us in that? And I appreciate that you're in this discernment process. And again, respect, because I think that must be incredibly difficult. But how, how should we think about that? Uh, how do you know when God is speaking? You yourself said you weren't sure that that was coming from God. How, how ultimately do you find that resolution? Okay, uh, Tim, I'm gonna comment briefly, but again, I'd be interested in what others uh, have to say as well. Uh, number one, uh, the church um, unfortunately has sent mixed messages. You know, I, I think that that's a fact. And if anyone disagrees with that, please jump in. I want to be very fair about this. We have a mixed message. The, the Pope said one thing on one occasion. Now he's saying something else. So it seems, right? So you have that. The second is this. Um, and again, in my situation, I'm dealing with uh, transgender students, uh, gay students, lesbians. I'm listening to them, right? And I'm listening to their pain. So as I listen to their pain and as I talk to them, I'm saying to myself, well, these are people made by God, right? Would God make them uh, to really live in this tortured way saying that they're not to have any kind of sexual related things of this sort? What kind of God would do this? I'm saying to myself as I'm listening to them. Right. Also, uh, as I'm listening to them, uh, I'm saying to myself, well, where there is love, there is God. No. Right. If there's authentic love, God is there. Right. So that's what's going on for me. Tim, I don't claim to have the final answer, but all I know is that there's something that's going on right now that's not exactly right. And it needs conversation. Conversation with who? Conversation with one another. Uh, with the local bishops and whoever else. So on Monday, uh, when I'm going to say to, in this gathering, uh, I am going to apologize to the students and to the faculty gathered. Uh, not that it's my role to represent the church, but I'm going to apologize for the mixed message. And I'm going to apologize. I, I equate this to the sex abuse issues. I'm going to apologize for any hurt that this is causing you. But I'm also, Tim, going to acknowledge the fact I don't have the final answers. But what I do know is that God loves you and that I love you, we love you, and that you have a place here. Beyond that, I don't have much else to say at this point in time. But what I want to invite you to is to further conversation on this so we can work on this together. Tim, I know that answers your question, uh, but that's how I'm dealing with this. And you might have a better way of dealing with that. I, mean, I don't know. Oh, that's beautiful. But like you, I'd like to hear from others. I think that's great. Um, yeah, I was, it's been difficult since the announcement. Um, and I think I was thinking what you were saying about um, kind of lay people and the struggles that Catholics have with um, lay ministry. And especially, you know, I think a lot about like the role of women um, in the church and um, I don't know if many people read Commonweal, but uh, it was, uh, they had an article that was, I didn't hear about this at the time, but on January 11th, Pope Francis, sorry, my Latin is out of a little rusty, but it was called Moto Proprio. And uh, it was basically saying that lay women can, you know, participate in ministries like reading and being altar servers and things, even though like this was common practice before, but it's like officially canon law. And, um, you know, I think it's difficult uh, to feel wanted or feel like uh, an equal participant when, um, you know, so there is so much mixed messaging and so much, uh, you know, lack of kind of, um, inclusion and um, and I think especially for young people it can feel difficult to um, 
feel included and feel like um, ownership over your faith when uh, these kind of messaging are coming out. And, um, you know, I this is just kind of rambling, but I just think um, I have been struggling and have been feeling like uh, what really can my role be, not in our parish because it's such an inclusive place, but just um, kind of even when I go to different parishes, it's, it's like, whoa, <laughs> kind of throws what we do at St. Francis de Sales in to greater spotlight because I do feel included and I do feel wanted, but that's not um, the case in so many other places. So I think it is related to this issue of, you know, lay people's role. And um, I think as we move forward, it's going to, you know, we're always talking about like young people aren't involved and things, but you know, you wonder why. And, uh, and uh, I think it's really going to become even maybe more of a crisis than it already is if we can't really come into conversation about these things. Thank you, Bridget. I was gonna say, as a teacher, if you have students in a classroom of mixed ability, uh, to what level do you teach? Uh, some teachers say you teach to the middle of the class. Other people say that you teach to the bottom of the class. So I think when the church makes pronouncements, the question is who are they making the pronouncement to? And I think sometimes they make it to the lowest level. Uh, they, they don't consider that the majority of the people in church are educated. I'll give you an example. I know in the German church, uh, people who were Eucharistic ministers used to wear albs as Eucharistic ministers. And they would come up to stand behind the priest uh, at the time of the sign of peace. And that was verboten, excuse the word, uh, because the church, some officials of the church felt that people would would uh, think that these were priests. And of course, if some of them were women, that would be really confusing for the faithful. So sometimes the church just uh, you know, aims at the lowest level of education and I think makes pronouncements uh, that a lot of educated people then you know, just don't understand. And I think in this example of, of the most recent letter, uh, it's that, is there a difference between blessing the same-sex union, and the celebration of marriage or matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony. And I think that's the church's problem is that poor people who are uneducated are going to confuse the two and think that because a priest is blessing a marriage, he's performing the sacrament of matrimony. So, so that's the way I see it. Thanks, Tim. Father Tim, I think that's such an interesting point of like who the church speaks to. And I think that's something um, that I, I don't want to say I struggle with, but it's hard to understand the church's, uh, the institutional church's message when you have a religion that is based on such complex and unknowable issues. So like to be Catholic, you have to believe in one God and three persons, like so very difficult things, yet they seem to reduce very complex human issues to things that are, uh, you know, very straightforward. So, you know, why wouldn't they let us live with these complexities in other issues as well? Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if that's a, <laughs> a good answer to that, but I, I think when I'm reflecting on these things, that's something I try to keep in mind is that very similar to what you're thinking, Brother Tim, is that these are complex and, you know, as individuals, like we are called to reflect on them um, in addition to what the, the institutional church is saying. Thank you, Colleen. Oh, unmute yourself, Phil. <laughs> and then you'll be allowed to talk because I say so. <laughs> thank, thank you, James. <laughs> Tony, thank you. I think you're doing uh, a great job walking us through this. And, you know, I, I'm glad you started with the issue about what's going on up at Sacred Heart and your particular discernment in that process vis-a-vis -vis the uh, question of blessing gay unions. 
because it is certainly on the, the minds and in the hearts of so many people in parishes like DeSales. And um, I, I'm going to just throw this piece in. What I think is interesting about Francis, the Pope, is that he is someone who very believes in dialectic, in that you can come from um, two different places and that in the debate and in the exchange of ideas, you can discern where the spirit is. Now, we kind of go, well, yeah, that makes sense. And that's a real, you know, that's a real tried and true kind of way of doing science and all sorts of things. But we have to remember historically for the past several years, that has not been our modus operandi in the church. Very often it's been to close questions down. You know, definitively, we can't speak about this anymore. Francis has had, I believe, the courage and the spiritual freedom and maturity to be able to say, let's talk about it. You know, um, he recognized, and it goes back to Tony's point about no model of the church can stand on its own. He recognizes we need the institution. We need to have a process where, you know, to a certain extent, the buck stops here. But for the buck to stop there, Francis recognized there has to be a lot of discussion, discernment, prayer, movement. And he's allowing this, I think, in a way that hasn't been seen before. And that can be an uncomfortable place for all of us to be because, well, I want him to be on my side. Um, just a little bit of context with this piece about the letter that, or the recent pronouncement. There are those who felt that the timing of the, um, the uh, pronouncement was significant. It was right before Francis's trip to Iraq. What it means by that he approved this as opposed to he's acknowledged it is a very different thing. Um, the short, like I think it was last week, Tony, you might remember, he came out in a talk that he was giving and spoke about the importance of moral theology, but moral theology does not live in a vacuum. It is uh, incarnated amongst real life people and their experiences. This is the way Francis does theology. You know, he's, he doesn't come out and say, this is verboten and we can't, or this is absolute, he leaves a space for, um, for the spirit to work. And, and I think for, to a certain extent, that may be what's happening with this. Uh, for him to, again, the piece that, I, Tony, I don't think you touched on it, but what he has revved up on steroids, Francis, is his concept of a synodal church a church that walks with one another, laity, clerics, you know, all sorts of people. It was spoken about during the Second Vatican Council. It was initiated in some ways, but it's also taken a real hiatus. And Francis has basically said, there is no other way to be church. And that to be in a synodal way means to be in places where we're not always comfortable. And I know Tony, and that pretty much that's, that's it for me. So go ahead. Yeah. No, Phil, thank you. You would think we had planned this, but this actually leads into my next point. So I'm going to pick up on this, on, on the synod idea. And really what uh, Phil is saying, this principle of synodality. Um, and basically, what Father Phil just mentioned, that at the Second Vatican Council, um, Pope John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth brought together a, bishops from around the world, about 23 or 2400. It was the largest gathering of the church. And what you saw at the council were multiple opinions, right? And you found dialogue, you found disagreement, you found fighting, you found drama, the whole nine yards. But in that process, that they moved towards a synthesis. And this gets to Phil's point about the dialectic. And Francis thinks this way. What he does is he likes to throw up different balloons about this or that. And he allows more so than I probably would, he allows space for all kinds of, of opinions. So for example, if it were up to me, 
I would like, I mean, I shouldn't say this out loud, I would lock Cardinal Burke in the closet and throw the key away. Now, Pope Francis won't do that. He's allowing this man to speak and really causing a great deal of difficulty. Uh, and also that would be true of Biggie Ho. Uh, that would be true of Biggie Ho, who directly talks against the Holy Father. He allows it to happen because eventually his view is the truth will emerge. And as Phil says, in the dialectic, you'll move to, towards a synthesis to where God is. So this principle of synodality, if you look at the picture here, the picture speaks a thousand words. You see the Pope, you see the Bishop, right? You see some nun, you see a man, you see women. There's all kinds of people in there. So the notion of synodality is bringing everyone together. Now, you may not remember this, but when he had the synod on youth, he surveyed the entire church. Do you remember that? We had to fill out these surveys, right? And I remember I said it to sales. I remember whatever mass I said, well, you better fill it out. They may never ask us again <laughs> what we think. So this is our big chance they're asking us. <clears throat> but the whole point is, he is, this is what we say. We talk about what we call in Latin, the census fidelum, <clears throat> the sense of the faithful. So the people have a sense and God is speaking through that sense of the people. So for example, <clears throat> in 1967 with Humanae Vitae, this was a thing on birth control, right? Pope Paul VI came out with this and caused a ruckus throughout the world. Remember this? Some remember this about the birth control. Now, it was the first time in the history of the church, 1967, that people said, we do not agree with this, but we're not leaving, we're staying. That never happened before. So what this does is this, it doesn't mean that it's a free for all, but it means there's a voice for everyone around the table. But if you can go to the next slide, let me just see what's there. Okay, and again, the whole notion of synodality is we're all in this together, right? And again, you notice the diversity of people. Uh, and just go to the next. <clears throat> right. What is synodality? Right. This comes from Pope Francis uh, in this book. I believe you, we did this at the sales, Let Us Dream. <clears throat> did we do this, Phil? I'm not recalling if we did this book or not. <clears throat> we may even have done it. But anyway, it's a recent book uh, about Pope Francis. Right? And the second chapter is very much about discernment. So in this book, he says, what is synodality? Synodality starts with hearing from the whole people of God. The church that teaches must first be a church that listens. Consulting all members of the church is vital because as the second batting council reminded us, the faithful as a whole are anointed by the Holy Spirit and cannot err in matters of belief. That's pretty profound. The faithful as a whole. So when we talk about infallibility, it's not just, say, the Pope and a couple of bishops. It's all of us. If the whole people of God are together on something, well, God is speaking in this, most likely. I will be with you always. He said, I'll be with you always. It's not just with the Pope, it's all of us. So does it mean that the Pope and the Bishop don't have a special role? Indeed, they do. But what he's expanding, he's including us as well. We're included in the conversation before we weren't, All right? Uh, let's just see the next slide, Lydia. Let me see what's there. Okay, so a synod produces intense discussion, involves different reactions and responses to those who think differently. So it requires a respectful and mutual listening, a willingness to change our way of thinking, and it is a patient process. And I wanna emphasize this word, a patient process. Why? Because I believe that we are living in such a moment in this post-COVID church. Uh, it is my belief in conversations and studies that I'm doing that as a result of COVID, when we come back, it ain't gonna be the same. 
So it's getting used to different. And what is that going to mean? Where is God leading us? So I do think we're at a very new and different point that's going to require respectful, mutual listening, changing the way we do church, and entering a patient process that doesn't have all of the answers right away, because we simply don't. Be careful of anyone who has all the answers, because nobody does. All right. So those. this comes from Pope Francis, by the way. This is from his book, Let Us Dream. This is the process that we're entering into. I love this picture, by the way. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, this is St. Vincent de Paul. And he's gathered around the table with all different kinds of people, uh, the poor. Uh, and I, I'm imagining this. Uh, there's some there that are people of color. And I'd be willing to guess there might be a gay or a lesbian in there or a transgender. I don't know if they had those in those days, uh, the transgenders. But he's gathering with others around the table. See, if we can bring everyone around the table and listen to everyone, doesn't mean we agree. Doesn't mean that everybody, you know, it, it's not a democracy. We're just voting on whatever. But we bring all the voices around the table, right? And to me, uh, this is a... a, a to me, is the image of what synodality is. So what is God saying on 96th Street? Now, you might say, does God speak on 96th Street, right? Well, he doesn't speak there, he doesn't speak anywhere. So that's, that's what we're concerned about. What is God saying on 96th Street? So, hey, by the way, I don't claim to know, so don't, don't look for answers here. So I think the, these are tools now for further conversation. Right, uh, design, defining the sermon of spirits. What do we mean by different movements, and what's the criteria for evaluating? So I just want to quickly address this. Right, discerning spirits is noticing the movements that are going on with me as an individual, and then go back to that image of the table, all those people around the table, the black people, the white people, the gays, the transgenders, what's going on, right? What, what, what is the movement that's going on here? What are the feelings that are emerging, all right? And so what we mean by a movement is that God very well might be speaking through the through me as an individual, but us as a gathering. Keep in mind, that's how God communicates. That's what happened at the council. That's what happens in a synod. That's what Pope Francis is saying should happen in our parishes, that we're paying attention when we gather around the table to the movements that are there. And possibly, possibly, something might be coming from God. And it takes time to get a sense of, to get a sense of this. And so simply what St. Ignatius would say, and this is very Ignatian, I'm just giving you, uh, you know, a, a few brief things on this and to, to kind of make it simple. There are certain things that move us towards God, right? And uh, when we talk about, uh, okay, well, so you can stay there. Uh, something that moves us towards God, right? Uh, yeah, let's stay there for a second something that's moving us towards God. What's keeping us in relationship with God? So as we're having a discussion, right, is this something that's leading us closer to God or is it drawing us away from God, right? And what Ignatius would say, anything that's drawing us away from God is not from God. What Ignatius would also say is that we live in the light. We are as sick as our secrets. If in fact, we're in the dark and we don't bring to the table, he would say that that is not of God. How do we evaluate? Well, people would say, well, if I feel peaceful, well, what does that mean? Well, feeling peaceful might be because I slept well last night. Uh, that, that's not a form of evaluating. Form of evaluation is, is the decisions that we're coming to, does it make a difference in the way in which I am living? So what, um, 
what's his name? Don uh, Richard would say, uh, Don Chapman would say, if you need to know how you're doing, look to the charity of your life. So when you see that component happening in a community or in an individual, that's a sure sign that God is working in this way. You see, if there is not charity, well, there's a problem there. This may not be from God, right? So you get a sense really, this is drawing us closer together. It's drawing us closer to God. And the outcome is a greater sense of charity among us. That is the best tool I know of in terms of evaluating, all right, in terms of where God is leading. Let's just quickly look at the next slide. Uh, okay. And basically, when Pope Francis addressed Congress in 2015, he talked about the contemporary world. And he talked about polarization. And what he says is there's a lot of open wounds which affect us. This is 2015. Demands that we confront every form of polarization that would divide us into two camps. We know that be freed of the enemy without, we can be tempted to feed the enemy within. See, this is very Ignatian. The divided country that we're living in and the divided church that we're living in is not from God. See, what the Pope would say, Ignatius would say that anything that divides, the Satan is anything that divides. So a real problem that we have is this, or the divisions in the country, the divisions in the church. We're fortunate at St. Francis de Sales. I don't think that there's any serious divisions among us, but there's parishes where there are. See, those kinds of divisions do not come from God. This is what he said in 2015. Let's quickly look at the next slide. Okay, simply what the Pope is saying, and this is what he said when he was in Iraq. He said, basically, He's saying, Let, let's think outside the box. And I wanna get back to the point that I made earlier. We need to start thinking about a post COVID parish. What does it mean, All right? Uh, and I could speak at length about this, but I'm not, I'm just gonna leave it at that. And it's Lydia, just go to the last slide. Cause I, then after we'll take any comments. I'm leaving a lot of points out here. Okay, so, uh, uh, go back to the last. Okay, so simply the, the, I leave us is this, is what is your dream? All right, and I believe that what your dream is, what your desire is, is what St. Ignatius would say, that's the beginning of the sermon. What is our dream when we start talking together as a community? That's the next phase. But ultimately, what is God's dream for us? And it really comes from Jeremiah chapter 29. I have a plan for you, Jeremiah 29 says, and it is a future full of hope. So the agenda is how do we get in touch with God's plan? A plan that is a future full of hope. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I've talked too long. I didn't intend to talk this much. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's any concluding comments or questions or whatever. I would just say it was a beautiful session, Tony. I learned a lot, I took away a lot. I'm happy to hear about this notion of synodality. I pray that that is our future because when I hear bright minds like Bridget and Colleen, I believe they are the Holy Spirit of the future of the church. And unless we have this dialogue that goes from a command and control structure to one that's truly a dialogue where we truly are listening to and hearing others, uh, I believe it will be hard uh, to, to visualize the future for the church. I've confessed to Father uh, Philip in the past, my own guilt at failing, I think, to transmit my faith to my four daughters. And yet when I hear Bridget, uh, it becomes very eloquently clear why uh, there's been this breakdown. We say there's a synodality, we say we listen, and everyone gets to express their opinions, and yet young people today who perhaps they're impatient, perhaps because they want quicker return on investment, whatever it is, are simply disconnecting. They're not engaging, and, and that's the concern. And so 
I hope and pray that uh, starting with our church, our dream, you know, what God wants for us in this parish, we can continue to truly foster that dialogue and be open to that change and, and listen with all our hearts uh, more than we speak. Thank you, Tim. And I want to piggyback on what Tim said. Tony, you said from the Pope's last book that part of synodality was a willingness to change the way we're thinking. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, no, that was the Pope, not me. Yes. Well, that's what I wanted you to say, because Bridget, I, I, I loved everything you said, and I saw people responding to you, you know, as a woman working in the church and as somebody who from birth has been impatient. Um, I get frustrated with the larger picture of the church, but I have been very blessed to find places to, to pray and work like St. Francis and the parishes I was in before. I think to hear that the Pope actually wrote down that we as a people of God need to be able to change our way of thinking. If that means the institutional church, then I can be a little bit more, then I can learn to be a bit more patient if I think there are other people over there that believe that. So, Tony, you said the Pope said that. I'm going to hold you to that. Because <laughs> I think part of the problem is when we think other things, when we, we think we have a right to have, be a part of the conversation, we get shut down and we're told, well, no, this is the way it is. So that's exciting for me. And it gives me something to dream about. I'd like everyone to discern. Uh, and obviously the great thing about this is that it was recorded. So people who couldn't be here today can view it and, and get their own takeaway. But if we could discern individually and then communally, where do we go next with this process in terms of refining, making uh, real the dream here, our priorities, how we are church, how we want to become church. Thank you, Father Tony. I think left us with some really good questions um, and obviously ones we want to spend some time reflecting on but would love to have the opportunity to gather as a group again to maybe discuss them. I just wanted to also just mention that um, it would be great as we're thinking about this going forward how to get more voices and maybe diverse voices in this conversation. Um, I'm just noticing people who I'm used to seeing at mass who aren't here you know different um, voices that might be important as we go forward and just figuring out a way to to do that so um everyone feels that they can be a part of it and are included thank you for our time together uh, you know as i look at you uh you give me hope this is the church uh as i experience it on the ground and when you look at the totality of models who we are as a group is a very important part of what it means to be church so uh i'm very grateful uh, for you at the sales for the way uh, we're there for each other. You make church happen, right? It was uh, Cardinal Sunins at the end of the council wrote this um, piece. I'm just going to read the last two paragraphs as a way of closing. And they asked him, why are you a person of hope? And I think it's something we need to ask ourselves. You don't want to lose that. Oh, I don't want to lose it. All right. Although I have my moments, <laughs> quite frankly, I don't want to lose this. All right. So this is what he says. Um, he says, I believe in the surprises of the Holy Spirit. The council was such a surprise and Pope John was another. And what I would add, and so was Pope Francis a surprise. They took us aback. Why should we think that God's imagination and love might be exhausted? Hope is a duty, not a nicety. Hope is not a dream, but a way of making dreams become a reality. Happy those who dream dreams and are ready to pay the price to make them become true.